In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, hear the gospel of your Lord, Matthew chapter 4. When Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease in sickness among the people. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I was born in the Holy Land, not Israel, but Michigan, about two and a half hours to the north. Grew up there on the shores of Saginaw Bay, Bay City, Michigan, Lake Huron, and that means that there is never a time where I can't remember fishing. I remember early on that all a man needed to do was tie some corn to a string at the end of a stick and you could get yourself a bluegill or a bullhead, but but eventually you want to go where the real fish are, and that meant upgrading your tackle to a perch rig and a Zebco rod and reel so you could get out on the big water on Grandpa Christie's pontoon. Eventually, the walleye came into Saginaw Bay, and that meant then trading in your perch rig for hottentots and crawler harnesses, trolling behind the boat. Eventually, I figured out what salmon fishing was all about, where your rod and reel was traded in for a rod that felt more like a broomstick in a hand. The point is, of course, that a fisherman really only needs to know two things. One, where are the fish? Two, What kind of hook is going to get the job done? Brothers and sisters, Jesus knows where the fish are. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And now it was time for Jesus to do some fishing himself. Not for perch, but for people. And Jesus knew precisely the tackle that he was going to use. Luke, in his edition of this account, says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people. It all sounds so quaint, doesn't it? Fishermen cleaning their nets, boats pulled up onto the beach, men getting ready for the next night's job. And meanwhile, down the beach, something dramatically different is happening. Jesus is going fishing, not with a fishing net, but with a gospel net. And as the people began to school around him, such a crowd formed that eventually Jesus commandeered Peter's fishing boat, set off a little from shore. Why? Because any man that's gone fishing with little kids in a quiet evening can tell you sound travels exceedingly well over water. Jesus sets out from shore and proclaims the good news of the kingdom to men and women. 
Notice the tackle Jesus uses. He doesn't use a hook to drag men face first into his boat by force. Instead, he casts the gospel net to capture the hearts and souls of men and women with the good news that sets them free. Which is a lot more than what Peter and Andrew and James and John could say for the night before. They were, they were skunked. And it's at that precise point that Jesus, the carpenter from the highlands, gives the fishermen some fishing advice. Put out into deep water, Jesus said, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. The carpenter's fishing advice didn't make a bit of sense to fishermen who knew what they were doing. Jesus ever tell you anything that doesn't seem to make a bit of sense? I've got a couple for you this morning. You know that God teaches us that precisely because we believe in him, We can anticipate hardship and persecution in life. How does that make any sense when the creator of the cosmos is supposedly in your corner? Or, Jesus says that it is more blessed to give than to receive. That in giving things away, we are even more rich. That sounds like fuzzy math if I've ever heard of fuzzy math. Or, Jesus says that a righteous man's prayer changes things, that mountains get uprooted and get tossed into the sea when a righteous man prays. How does that make any sense whatsoever when God already knows everything that's going to happen and he knows precisely what he's going to do even before you ask? Come to think of it, that God knows everything, that God is everywhere, That God and man are one in Christ Jesus, all of it just makes no sense. So what are we going to do with that? Are we in faith going to go out into the deep water with Peter at Jesus' command? Or are we going to opt to sit on the beach and play around in the sands of skepticism and maybe build a sandcastle of unbelief or two on the beach? Well, what did Peter do? They went fishing. Because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. What did they do? They listened, brothers and sisters. They listened to the clear words of Jesus. And what happened? The night before when they should have caught something, they got skunked. And in the middle of the day when they should have caught nothing, the nets broke because of all the keepers in them. It turns out that the Lord Jesus, who one day would walk on those same waters of Galilee, also by the power of his word had complete control of the creatures that swam in those same waters. And how is it that they caught those keepers? Well, it turns out that the same Jesus, who one day would speak to those waters, quiet, be still, and the sea was like glass, by the power of his word, also caused Galilee's keepers to swim for the nets rather than swim away. It wasn't fishermen's luck. It was the clear, powerful word of Jesus. So, what clear, powerful words has Jesus spoken to you? Trouble in hardship must serve a good purpose has to be for God has promised you that all things work for together for the good of you who love him that in giving things away we are even more richly blessed has to be because your God has promised that your crops will overflow and your barns will overflow and your vats will brim over with new wine 
that your prayer changes things? It has to happen. Because Jesus, after all, says that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and it is effective. And that even though I by my sin and you by your sin have slapped God in the face in a million and one wicked ways, that we stand forgiven? It has to be. Because has not God said, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly? The point. We were 100% sinful by birth. Which is precisely why Jesus died on the cross to take away 100% of our sin. That because of our sin, we deserve 0% of God's blessings. And what does God do in pure grace? He turns right around and gives us his son. And in giving us Jesus, he's graciously given us all things. Peter, you remember how his story ends, don't you? At the end of the gospel, denying that he ever knew Jesus. God Curse me if I know who you're talking about, Peter says. Peter didn't deserve Jesus' forgiveness any more than he deserved Jesus' fish. But because Jesus is merciful and gracious, he received the forgiveness of his sin just as surely as the fish broke the nets that day. How full are your nets today? Not with walleye. I don't know if we have any Lake Erie fishermen here this morning. But everything else, the family sitting next to you in the pew, the pastor this worker training Sunday that serves you with word and sacrament, a beautiful sanctuary to worship the king of creation in, no fear whatsoever, for instance, a militant Islam and what was going to happen to you if you were caught worshiping Jesus this Sunday morning. A warm house, all your own. A lunch waiting for you at home. All God's blessings. Well, Professor Christie, you don't realize how difficult I have it. Indeed, I may not, but do any of you think for four seconds this morning that there aren't 40 million Ukrainians that would switch spots with you? No questions asked today? I ask the question, you know the answer. And if you really think your nets aren't that full, go home and look in the fridge and look in your cupboard and look in your closet and then ask yourself, do I every now and then have a little difficulty closing the doors on all of the stuff that God has graciously given me? What was Peter's reaction to all of Jesus' goodness to him? Ready? When Simon Peter saw this, He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Are you surprised at that reaction? Brothers and sisters, this is the catch of a lifetime. A boat full, sinking full of keepers. Wouldn't you expect Peter to go up to Jesus and and give him a fist bump and say, all right, what a day. Or wouldn't you maybe expect Peter to go down to the local cafe and sip a coffee with his fishing buddies and tell them about a a once-in-a-lifetime day on the water? Or maybe you would expect Peter to go up to Jesus and maybe give him a, a thankful handshake and a pat on the back and maybe a good man hug. Instead, what's Peter do? He comes to Jesus and falls on his knees. He says, go away, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Jesus' goodness did nothing but highlight Peter's sinfulness. Peter's full nets highlighted the emptiness of Peter's heart. Go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. But Jesus doesn't honor that request, does he? Instead, he stands right there in front of Peter and says this, don't be afraid. Brothers and sisters in Christ, 
Are we weak? Are we running on empty? Are we filled with sin? May I invite you this morning to tell Jesus something he doesn't already know? Which is precisely why all over again today I've driven five hours and 34 minutes to cast the gospel net. A net that doesn't kill, but a net that causes us to live. Before that gospel net caught us, our life was so much like a fish, kind of random swimming here, there, everywhere, no real purpose, no real aim and goal in life. But once that net is cast and once we are Jesus' keeper and we are in safe, the boat of the church, the ark of the church, lo and behold, the value that you have, brothers and sisters, that the Lord Jesus himself would willingly come to suffer and die and rise so that we might be kept by him. Brothers and sisters, you belong to Jesus, hook, line, and sinker. And once Peter realized that, it was now time for a midlife change of career. To trade in the hook for the book. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed Jesus. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing the nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed after him trading in their hook for the book, the things their eyes would see as the dawning light of salvation dawned in the land of darkness. And as one by one, Satan's dastardly deeds are undone, one sermon, one teaching, one healing at a time, that those men, Peter and Andrew, James and John, would be a living, walking, talking fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy as the kingdom of God was now come in the land of Galilee. Go away? No. Jesus comes with a word of salvation. Which brings me this morning to one final thought today. At the seminary where I teach, am privileged to teach future pastors, I often tell the men in preaching class that it's, it's often the little words of the Bible, the words that at first you really don't always notice, that tend to be pretty significant. Did you catch them? At once, they left their boat nets and followed him. Immediately, they left their boat and father and followed him. Do you notice the earnestness there? They didn't, we're not told that they took some time to put the list, the boats and the nets on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, we're not told of, of a going away party that they had at the corner cafe in Capernaum. We're not even told that they said goodbye to, to Zebedee and Mrs. Zebedee and then went a, a week later. No, now, at once, immediately, the boats and nets could wait. Mom and dad would be okay. Now was the time of salvation. Now was the day of God's favor. Today is the day that Jesus calls to follow. Brothers and sisters, in post-COVID America, we are in desperate need of some Christian urgency once again. As churches in our land gradually empty out, why is that? Well, it's because Christianity is still sort of a respectable hobby that you can practice, like fishing and golf and, and shopping and hiking and whatever else you, you need to do in a week. Think of how that sounds. I'll take my kids to Sunday school next week. I'm really going to take church attendance more seriously when I retire. You know, I'm really intending to give more to the worldwide mission of, of the preaching and teaching of, of the good news when the, the house is paid off, or my car lease is paid off, or my, my dream vacation is paid off, or tuition is paid off. I'm really going to do that. I'm going to get serious about daily devotion time with God's word tomorrow. 
I'm going to do one of those yearly read through the Bible starting New Year's. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Someday. And all the while, Jesus is craving for saving. Right here. Right now. Lame excuses. Every one of them. If procrastinating at work gets a man fired, what ought to procrastinating with the Christian faith get us? Lord, go away from me. I am a sinful man. But he doesn't. All over again today, Jesus is here in your midst, just as sure as two or three have gathered together. All over again today, Jesus' gospel net is cast out into the water, and it is a beautiful thing to see the catch. All over again today, in just a few moments, in mouth and soul, you will be made whole through body and blood for your forgiveness. And at that very moment, Jesus is there with you, for you, in you, with every ounce of forgiveness that he ever won for you. All over again today, disciples are called and pastors and teachers are taught and pastors and missionaries are sent that the gospel net may go out further and further until the boat of the church is is brimming to overflowing. All over again today, young men and women are trading their hook for the book that many more might come to know Jesus, the fisherman that sets them free. Brothers and sisters, I've heard of of several amalgamations of our Lutheran churches here in the Toledo area. May I encourage you to be a little bold now with the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be bullish on the good news that sets us free, to be confident as the net is cast, certain of this, That as that net is cast in the confidence of the Lord Jesus Christ, that keepers that we can't even dream of are being ready to be brought into the ship of God's church. Jesus promises it in your Jesus is faithful. Amen. Please stand. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.